Tonight then, let us return to Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18, the passage that we read earlier. I'm not going to isolate one verse and select that as our text. Instead, we're going to look at the whole chapter. And this chapter is in three sections. And that's really where I'm going to get my three headings from, from the three sections in this chapter. The title I would like to give to our meditation tonight is simply, Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Well, the first section we have here is from verses 1 to 7. Verses 1 to 7. And here we have God, he speaks to Aaron about the priesthood. Here God is speaking to Aaron about the priesthood in verses 1 to 7. And just a brief reminder of what happened in the, the previous two chapters. There was a rebellion among the, the Levites. They tried to take over. They thought that they could be like Aaron. And the Lord had to judge them and a number of them were burnt alive and others died. Over 14,000 on one occasion and over 250 of the princes of the people along with Korah. So there was a terrible time of judgment that fell upon the people because they would not accept what God had ordained. And the last chapter we looked at, we noticed that Aaron was again uh, called, if you like, or validated or authenticated as the high priest above everyone else when his rod budded and the other rods remained exactly as they were before. And therefore, the Lord had truly authenticated and vindicated the ministry and his selection of Aaron to be the high priest and his family to follow him as priest of the Lord. And now in this chapter here, we have the Lord speaking directly to Aaron. There is a point here, actually, when we look at this. Normally in these books, the Lord would speak to Moses, or the Lord might speak to Moses and Aaron, or the Lord might speak to Moses in order that he might communicate with Aaron. But here we have the Lord speaking directly to Aaron himself. Again, this was to impress upon all around him that Aaron was God's man. There's no doubt about it. And if they were going to defy this, they were defying what God had instituted and what God had approved. Here was God speaking directly to Aaron without the covenant mediator, Moses. And he speaks to Aaron about the priesthood. And really what we find in this chapter is, in some sense, a rehearsal or going over what he had said previously in the book of Numbers. But we cannot really understand this chapter unless we first read the last two verses of the previous chapter. And these last two verses, 12 and 13 of chapter 17, And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? And what you find here in chapter 18 is basically the Lord addressing these two verses. In some sense, the penny has dropped. They have begun to realize that they cannot be willy-nilly with the Lord. They cannot be willy-nilly regarding the tabernacle. Not everyone can go to the tabernacle. You're not to go near it. You're not to touch it. 
And suddenly it seems as if the penny has suddenly dropped and they began to realize all around them is death. And it's all around them because they have not the fear of God that they should have. And this is what the Lord is, is impressing upon them. That they are to fear their God. He is a glorious God. A holy God. And what he has instituted and set down is to be obeyed. No matter how good the other Levites might be, or no matter how good the princes of the people might be, no matter how clever, or no matter how articulate they may be, they will never be priests. They will never do the office of Aaron and his sons. Because God, in his sovereignty and his all overarching providence, has not called them to that office. And they are to realize that. And it does seem that they begin to realize it. We cannot go near the tabernacle. Because if we go near the tabernacle, we will die. And therefore, they are in some sense beginning to fear the Lord. Now the Lord is speaking to Aaron. And basically in these verses, he is saying to Aaron, the buck stops with you. You're in charge of the sanctuary. You're in charge of the priesthood. You're in charge of the, the offerings and the sacrifices. This is your domain. This is your responsibility. And you are to make sure that no one is to come near the sanctuary. No one's to get involved in anything to do with the sanctuary unless they have a divine commission from the living God. The Levites, as we looked upon it before, they had the responsibility. The various Levites were able to look after the, the structure, the furnishings. That was their remit. They couldn't go near the altar. They couldn't get involved in uh, sacrificing that was for the priests. And Aaron was to oversee this. He was to guard the, the sanctuary. Being a priest indeed was very hard work. They had a lot to do. Sacrificing. Attending to all the affairs of the, the tabernacle. It was no easy thing to sacrifice all these animals, to be up to their neck and blood on occasions. I'm speaking figuratively, of course, but it was a bloody job. It was a terrible thing. It was no light matter. And it was not for anyone to do it unless the Lord had called them. And the Lord had only called Aaron and his sons. And this was a great responsibility. And it was an exceedingly dangerous job, or calling, or vocation. Look at verse 3, what does it say? That neither they nor ye also die. Verse 7, I have given the priest's office unto you as a service of gift, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Verse 22, again. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of the congregation, lest they bear sin and die. Verse 32, the last words, lest ye die. Aaron, therefore, and his sons, and to a lesser extent the Levites, they had a care and a concern over the, the, the furnishings and the fabric of the tabernacle, they were to guard it. They were to keep the other tribes away from it. That was their remit. And this is teaching them, and it is teaching us today, about the fear of the Lord. Now, when you talk about the fear of the Lord, many people think it's legalism, it's not a nice thing to talk about the fear of the Lord. Surely we have a heavenly Father who loves us, who sent forth His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die in a Roman place. And all of these things are true. But nevertheless, it is required of the Christian that he knows something about the fear of the Lord and that he practices the fear of the Lord. 
And this can easily be illustrated when you consider our normal, everyday family life. If you're a parent, you will have young children, and they will grow up before you. Sometimes these children will have fears that they should not have. They might have fears of the dark, and you might tell them, well, there's no need to fear the dark. Just because you cannot see it, there's no ghost, there's no bogeyman, there's nothing like that. You're not to have a fear of the dark. But you are to have a fear of many things. This is not so common nowadays, but the principle is exactly the same. If you had an open fire, you would tell the child, keep away from the fire, keep away from the hearth. Why? Because you're going to get burnt. And you want to instill in them a fear of being burnt. You could go back to the road. You want to teach them road sense. Cars are going flying back and forth. You keep them on the pavement and you tell them, don't cross the road unless it's clear. Look right, left or whatever. Or go at the traffic lights or whatever. But you instill in them a fear. And it's a fear because you love them. That's why. And you don't want anything to happen to them. Well, that's the kind of fear that we are to have of the Lord. We are to recognize his sovereignty. We are to recognize the things that he has ordained. And we are not to tamper with them. That's why James says, Be not many masters. There's many people would love to run to the pulpit and start to teach and start to preach when they should be nowhere near the pulpit. Nowhere near it. Because it's a fearful thing to take the public office of a teacher of the Word of God. Because they shall be judged more severely than others. The modern church We need to instill the fear of God. It would be easy to lamblast maybe modern evangelical churches and look at them and say, well, their worship is very light, it's very frothy, it's very sentimental, there's nothing really of reverence in it, in their worship and in their gathering together. Well, we're not here to speak of others. But we want to have the fear of God in Partick Free Church of Scotland. We want to appreciate that when we come aside from the things of this world, we are coming into the presence of God. That's what we want to do. There's nothing holy about the building. We don't believe that the building is like the temple, Solomon's temple. No, of course not. But we gather in that name that's above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we gather, there should be a certain fear and reverence and awe about us. We're not gathering so much with like-minded individuals, although we do that. We're gathering before God. And the fear of God should be upon us. We should leave the things of the world behind. Our conversation should be around the things of God. Have we lost this sense of reverence, of the fear of the Lord? Maybe we need to cultivate it again. It's something we need to look at and ponder. Paul tells the Hebrews, and some of these Hebrews were, well, they weren't nominal Christians by any means. They were devout. They were sincere. They had experienced real persecution, and they were about to face more persecution and during the first bout of persecution, they joyfully accepted people taking their goods from them, 
Such was their devotion to the Lord. They were not half-hearted Christians, but because a fresh bout of persecution was about to embrace them, many of them were thinking of going back to the old ways, the old ways of Judaism, because they never had persecution when they went to the temple and when they were involved in Judaism. And Paul is stirring up these Christians and it reminds them in the book of Hebrews of the wonderful blessings they have in Christianity in Christ that they did not enjoy in Judaism. And why then would you go back into Judaism? And he's warning them. He's exhorting them to press on. And in verse 30 and 31 of chapter 10, what does he say about God? For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And here's what we want to notice, friends. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing to, ha to fall into the hands of the living God. That's principally talking about falling into God's hands without a saviour, without a mediator. And maybe many of us are a bit lackadaisical regarding approaching the living God. All oh, that we had more of this spirit about us, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then he goes on to say later on in, this, in another chapter, for our God is a consuming fire. God has not changed. He's still the same God. He demands holiness. He demands righteousness. He demands reverence and respect. Yes, we bless God that we are urged to call him our Heavenly Father. Yes, and no one's going to deny it. But he's still to be feared. This was happening here. And Aaron was to be the one who would in some sense, help them to understand. They were right. They couldn't go near the sanctuary. But Aaron could. Aaron could. They couldn't. But Aaron was their substitute. There would be faults. There would be failings. There would be sins. But if the people went through Aaron, then they would be forgiven. They would be accepted. And that applies to us today. We have our Aaron. Who's our Aaron? Who's our great high priest? It is Jesus Christ the Lord. He's the one who has made us acceptable. Through him we can go to God. Through him our God is not a consuming fire. No. It's not a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't keep us away from the sanctuary. He's in the sanctuary for his people. We could never approach God in of our own selves. Absolutely impossible. But through Christ, as it was through Aaron and through the priesthood, they were accepted in the Beloved. Well then, secondly, we might notice from verses 8 to 24, here God speaks to Aaron about the offerings. God speaks to Aaron about the offerings. From verses 8 to 24. And someone mentioned in prayer about these things, and we find these things somewhat difficult today in our in our situation and the minister is not exempt from that point of view but what do we find here well we find here that God is providing for those who serve him full time God is no man's debtor and God will provide for his people and that's what we find here 
Aaron didn't choose to be the, the high priest. Neither did his sons and those that followed them. They had no choice in the matter. God appointed them. But God was going to provide for them. They were priests. And like everyone else, they had to eat. They had to drink. They had to be clothed. And through the offerings, they would be provided. And they would be well provided. Well provided, as I want to show to you later on. Aaron was to live off the offerings given from the people. What does verse 8 say? And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Behold, I also have given thee the charge of mine heave offerings of all the hallowed things of the children of Israel, and to thee have I given them by reason of the anointing, and to thy sons by an ordinance forever. All these gifts that were given to the Lord were given to Aaron and his sons. They were to receive the best of the produce. What does verse 12 say? All the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and of the wheat, the first fruits of them which they shall offer unto the Lord, them have I given thee. And furthermore, we find there in verse 15, the firstborn of men and beasts was given to the priests. Everything that openeth the matrix, that is the womb, in all flesh, which they bring unto the Lord, whether it be of men or beasts, shall be thine. The offerings, sometimes they would eat the offerings in the tabernacle. Other times, depending on what the offering, they could take some home. And provided the people were ceremonially clean at home, they could partake of the offerings also and eat them without any danger. But where were they, where were they going to get some cash? They couldn't live simply on the meat. Where were they going to get cash? Well, you have the oil, the wine, and the wheat. These things, they could be sold. And they could then get some cash for themselves. The same could be said for uh, those things that came from the, the womb of the beast. They could be sold also in order that Aaron could get some cash. And uh, the human who came from the womb, the first human that came from the womb, they had to be redeemed. Verse 16, And those that are to be redeemed from a month old shalt thou redeem according to thine estimation. And therefore, Aaron would get the cash. So all that Aaron was required was provided for him. His food and his cash was all provided for him by the offerings that were given by the people. And this, of course, is a, is a principle that we find in the New Testament. We noticed it when we went through Luke, in Luke chapter 10. I think it's when the Lord sent out his disciples to begin to preach the gospel two by two. In Luke chapter 10, verse 7. And in the same house remain, talking about the disciples, when they go into a strange place, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Matthew says much the same when, according to the same incident, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, telling them about the things that they're, they're not to take, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. In other words, he was to be provided for. If he was laboring for the Lord, the people were to provide for him. And Paul makes it distinctly clear, as we noticed some time ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live off the gospel. There, it's quite clear and plain. Now, the Apostle Paul didn't use that right. He forgot. He was happy to do that. 
but that's what God has ordained. And it's exactly the same in the Old Testament. The high priest and the priests were to survive and live, and we might actually say thrive, by the offerings that were given by the people. Someone has commented on, on this. Ten percent of the nation's produce was given to four percent of the nation's population. Now there are men here who are better with figures than I am, and probably with you as well, so I will go over that again. It's clear here that a tenth had to be given. So a tenth of the nation's produce was given to the tribe of Levi. Now the tribe of Levi represented about 4% of the population of Israel. And we can verify that by the numbering earlier on in the book of Numbers. So 10% was given to 4% of the population. That would surely tell me, and I believe it should tell you, that God was going to make sure that they were amply provided. There's no such thing as those who are called to serve the Lord to take a vow of celibacy or a vow of poverty. Not at all. Not according to what we find here. The high priest was to be well provided for. The high priest was a gift to Israel. Israel could not function without the high priest. And the Lord was going to provide amply for his servants who served him full time. This didn't always happen in Israel. There were times when the people did not give as they should have done. I'm going to quote one verse from Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 10. Here Nehemiah is looking out at Israel. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. What was happening? The Levites couldn't survive with the offerings the people were giving, so therefore they had to return to their fields and they had to work in their fields for their living. That's not the way God wants. The Lord cares for his servants, and he provides for them. This is obviously a prickly subject, and I'm glad to say it does not uh, involve myself, so I'm happy to speak about it. But let me give you this um, example, not necessarily a, a real-life example, but I'm sure it could well be. If a man is called to the ministry, and it's clear that he has been called to the ministry, the Lord has called him, and the church has backed that, and it's obvious the man should be in the ministry. He is called. He has a wife. He doesn't want his wife to work. Now, some people might say that's old-fashioned. Say what you like, but he might not want his wife to work. But he might not be able to survive. Is he going to send his wife out to work? Is it right? The Lord provided. They were, they were to be amply provided. And if that's not the case, then maybe there is something we need to look at, a deficiency. Because if someone has to send someone out to work in order to make ends meet, if they're in the ministry, then there is something wrong. 
because God does care for his servants. And God is no man's debtor. This is what we find here. Eve, Aaron was amply provided for because Aaron was a blessing to the Israelites and they needed him and they needed the priesthood. And if it wasn't for Aaron and the priesthood, the wrath of God would have fallen upon them continually. And therefore they were to value him and appreciate him. Briefly, thirdly, we have the third section, verses 25 to 32. What do we have here? In verses 25 to 32, God speaks to Moses about the Levites. Now, the Levites didn't share in the offerings. Instead, they got the tithes. The people give their tithes, and they give their tithes to Levi. And Levi got that tithe. The tithe was a tenth. And that was to keep Levi and in order that the Levites would survive. And of course, Aaron, the priests, and the Levites, none of them would have an inheritance in the land. None of them. They wouldn't have anything. Oh, they may have fields, but they, were, they did not belong to them. They were given fields to use or to make use of, but they were not theirs. They had no portion in the promised land. The Lord was their portion. But again, the Lord was looking after the Levites. They didn't have the offerings, but they did have the tithes. But what we want to notice here about the Levites, when they received the tithes, that they themselves had to give a tithe of the tithe to Aaron, to the high priest. Verse 28 will tell us this. Thus ye shall offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel, and ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. Here again, Aaron is well taken care of. The Levites would receive the tithes, and from that tithe they were to give their tithe to Aaron. What do we have here? We have unity. Unity. Aaron is there as the mediator. He is making sure that the wrath of God does not fall upon the community. God has given to Aaron, the Levites, in order that they might do the menial tasks of the tabernacle, and the people are to provide for them by their tithes and by their offerings. We have absolute unity and harmony. They're all working together to further the cause of the Lord their God. They all need each other. Israel cannot exist without their mediator. And it's the same, exactly the same for the Christian today. We cannot exist without the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Levites, they serve the Lord, give their lives, give their hearts, give their energy to the Lord, but that did not excuse them from giving their tithe to Aaron also. You can see it's a wonderful plan. When it was implemented, it made sure that everyone was catered for. Everyone. Aaron was well looked after. The Levites also. And the people enjoyed communion, and fellowship with God by this wonderful relationship where they all shared in everything. This is all part of the feet of the Lord. They were to show that they had the feet of the Lord by recognizing Aaron's uniqueness. 
and providing for him. Amen. And may the Lord be pleased to bless his word to us. Let us pray together.